We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Um, at the last general election, uh, Nicola Sturgeon revealed that Scottish Labour leader Kezia Dugdale had told her in a private conversation that she wanted to drop Labour's opposition to a second independence referendum. So on the eve of this election, would you like to share any private conversations she's having with Jeremy Corbyn? First Minister. None. Jackson Sorry, I didn't hear. Was that a no or a none? None. <laughs> I'm not sure that's credible because uh, I thought you had actually said... You actually said in this you actually said in this chamber a few weeks ago that you had had conversations with Jeremy Corbyn. Order, please. But last night, Nicola Sturgeon said she didn't think Labour's spending plans are credible. Yet still, she's happy to hand Mr Corbyn the nation's credit card. All because he'll give her what she really craves, that second independence referendum. However, in a recent BBC Breakfast interview, the First Minister warned that if she didn't get the referendum she's demanding, then all options would be open. She even declined to rule out legal action. Can the First Minister clarify what she meant by all options? And seriously, would she sue her way to India Ref 2? First Minister. There's a, there's a kind of easy solution to all of these worries that Jackson Carlaw clearly has, and it is this easy solution. The Tories could just respect the will of the Scottish people and respect how the Scottish people vote. So if the SNP win the election tomorrow, uh, perhaps that's the best advice for Jackson Carlaw. But let me, let me tell Jackson Carlaw what my priority is tomorrow, is to make sure I do everything I can to ensure that we're not waking up on Friday morning to a Boris Johnson government, because Tory governments will mean more cuts to our public services, rising child poverty, a hard Brexit. Uh, that is what a Tory government will mean for Scotland. And the way to stop that happening is to vote SNP. The SNP is the main challengers to the Tories in Scotland. So if we want not to be waking up to Boris Johnson on Friday, vote SNP for a better, brighter future for Scotland. Right. Mr. Carlo, Mr. Carlo, hang on one second. Mr. Carlo, hang on one second. Mr. Carlo, hang on one second. Could you just encourage members not to indulge in direct election eating, such as encourage... No, 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 no. I recognise... I recognise it's the day before the general election. I recognise the topics that are going to be discussed, and I'm absolutely happy with that. Would you mind just not ending either the questions or the answers with vote for a party or another party? Thank you. Yes. yes, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has never respected the settled will of the people when the question on independence was put in 2014. So, to borrow the phrase ministers are so fond of, it's a bit rich of her to start talking about others respecting election results when she's refused to accept the result of any referendum today. But after last night's leaders' debate, I had a message from a viewer. Kenny from Ayrshire, he said, Nicola Sturgeon says she wants me to make my voice heard. But what's the point when she just ignores everything I have to say because it doesn't suit her? I voted no to independence and so did most people in Scotland. But she just won't leave it alone. Why is it she only listens to some folk but not others? So why is that, First Minister? Why do you have a habit of only listening to those people who agree with you? Why do, the voices, why do the voices of over two million Scots who voted no in 2014 not count with you? First Minister. Well, presiding officer, I'm genuinely really surprised that Jackson Carlaw wanted to raise the BBC leaders debate last night because anybody who watched it would have seen him getting a real roasting from an audience absolutely scunnered and disgusted with Tory austerity driving people into poverty. Tell you what, let me talk about this settled will of the Scottish people, the 62% who voted to remain yeah, yeah. in the European Union. It used to be what Jackson Carlaw believed in and argued for as well, until of course he got his instructions from Boris Johnson and now he's a born again Brexiteer. Uh, the difference between me and Jackson Carlaw is this, 
He thinks it's OK for Boris Johnson to dictate Scotland's future to the people of Scotland. I think it's for the people of Scotland to choose our future. And the fact that the Tories don't want the people of Scotland to have that choice shows that they are running scared of the verdict of the Scottish people. I stand for choice. And on Friday morning, uh, we can be waking up to a future where the future of this country is in the hands of the Scottish people, not in the hands of Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. Jackson Carlo. But the people of Scotland did choose. And on page 16 of Nicola Sturgeon's Scotland's Future document, which she arranged to send to every household that requested it, it said in writing, this is a once in a generation yeah. vote. That's a commitment that she then signed up to with her predecessor in the Edinburgh Agreement. Yeah. She has never respected the result. She has never honoured the result. She has simply ignored the majority and kept the issue in place because that's all she's interested in doing. <laughs> Presiding officer, let's cut to the chase. Isn't it the case that people face a very stark choice tomorrow? They can support the SNP and come Friday see the First Minister hijacking every vote cast on Thursday as a mandate for a second independence yes. referendum, taking us back to more division and extended chaos next year. Or they can choose a different option. They can choose the Scottish Conservative and Unionists to stop IndyRef2 and let the country move on. First Minister. You know, people in Scotland in 2014 did vote no to independence, and in part they voted no. They voted no to independence because they were told that that was the way to protect Scotland's membership of the European Union. And here we are, five years later, with Jackson Carlaw and the Tories trying to drag Scotland out of the EU against our will. In a democracy, I know the Tories are not keen on democracy, but in a democracy, people have the right to change their mind when the circumstances change. Presenting officer, where I will agree with Jackson Carlaw was in this point. People do face a stark choice tomorrow. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. And down one path, there is a future dictated to us by Boris Johnson and the Tories, being ripped out of Europe, child poverty rising, more cuts and austerity for our public services. Alternatively, the people of Scotland can vote SNP, and a vote for the SNP is a vote to lock Boris Johnson out of Downing Street, to escape the mess of the Tory Brexit and to put Scotland's future into Scotland's hands. That's the better, brighter option I hope people across Scotland choose tomorrow. Can I just urge people not to use the term vote or choice? <laughs> um, question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Does the First Minister agree with her health secretary that primary care is the bedrock of the health service? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I, I think primary care is the bedrock of our health service. That, of course, is why uh, the Scottish Government is taking the action we are to invest more in primary care and to invest a greater percentage of the health uh, budget in primary care um, to shift the balance away from acute and specialist health care into the community. Of course, primary care is a bit much more than uh, general practitioners, vitally important though they are, uh, which is why we are promoting uh, the multidisciplinary primary care team. Uh, these are big challenges uh, for the health service, but it's really important work that we are determined to get on with. Richard Leonard. Um, an integral part of the new 2018 GP contract is the National Code of Practice for GP premises. This recommends that health boards reduce pressure on doctors by providing them with premises. But last week, GPs at the Maryfield Medical Centre in Dundee contacted me. They have been embroiled in protracted, protracted negotiations for almost two years over the transfer of their lease to NHS Tayside, even though the health board started to run services from that medical centre more than a year ago and even though the building has been assessed as being fit for purpose, NHS Tayside is still demanding that these GPs pay over £100,000 for work that even the landlord deems to be completely unnecessary. The doctors have told us that up to a third of GP practices in Tayside may be facing the same situation. 
They have petitioned the Scottish Government for support, but nothing has been done. First Minister, do you think this is acceptable? Will you listen to these GPs? Will you act to support them? And will you intervene? First Minister. Well, I'm very happy to look into the specific issue that Richard Leonard has raised today. I uh, would have thought that least negotiations are best conducted between the GPs and the health board in question, although given that Richard Leonard has raised it, I, of course, will look into it. What I do know, of course, is that we are investing heavily in uh, supporting general uh, practitioners and general practice. Uh, the number of GPs working in Scotland uh, has risen. Uh, we will invest £50 million uh, by 2021 in uh, our new groundbreaking uh, Scottish sustainability uh, premises scheme, which is aimed at securing general practice for the future. Uh, £41.5 million is already reimbursed uh, to practices through the premises uh, direction. So uh, we support both GPs and the premises that they work in. As I said in my uh, earlier answer, of course, we want to support a multidisciplinary uh, primary care team, which is why we're also supporting uh, pharmacists and physiotherapists to work uh, with GPs to make sure that people have the best care possible in the community. So, I, as I say, I'm happy to look into uh, that particular case, but generally uh, speaking, the picture for GPs who do a very difficult and very challenging job uh, is one where they see continued and growing support from the Scottish Government. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Well, the, uh, the Maryfield Medical Practice uh, wrote to me last week and they wrote to the First Minister at the same time. But the truth is that general practice and primary care are under immense pressure right across the country. The BMA has warned that there are workload pressures and that there is a GP shortage. And the truth is that Scotland is in the grip of a GP crisis. The very survival of GP surgeries is at stake. And incredibly, incredibly, the government still has no accurate, no up-to-date information and so no idea how many full-time equivalent GPs there are in Scotland. It has no accurate and so no up-to-date information and therefore no idea how long patients are waiting to see a GP. But we all know, we all know that they are waiting too long. First Minister... Patients who need a GP appointment are being let down. GPs like those in Dundee who need your support are being let down. After 12 years of your government, Scotland is being let down. First Minister, when will you finally recognise that Scotland is facing a GP crisis and that GPs and patients need a government that is on their side? Well, so the, the number of GPs working in Scotland actually is, uh, on the most recent figures, 5,049. Um, that's an increase on the uh, previous year. Uh, incidentally, uh, there are significantly more GPs per head of population than there are in England, uh, and there are significantly more GPs in Scotland per head of population than there are in Wales, where the Labour Party is actually in government. Uh, we also, of course, uh, we also, of course are uh, doubling uh, from £55 million to £110 million next year, our primary care improvement fund that is specifically to help accelerate uh, the expansion of multidisciplinary teams. Uh, the most recent figures show a 17.3% increase since 2006 in the number of GP training places uh, and of course as I said earlier on we're investing in GP premises. So I think with all of these things and all of the other things I could talk about here, the initiatives around rural recruitment and of course uh, the new uh, GP contract which was supported heavily by the BMA. We are taking the action to support GPs and make sure that it is at the heart of that jewel in the crown of the Scottish NHS which of, is of course primary care. So unlike uh, governments elsewhere in the UK, one of which of course is run by Labour, uh, this government is getting on with the job of facing up to the challenges in the NHS and bringing to bear the solutions that both those who work in our NHS and the patients who rely on it need and I would have hoped Labour would have welcomed some of that. Thank you. We have some supplementary questions. The first from Miles Briggs, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank 
husband. First Minister, this week a Freedom of Information request which I obtained revealed that over 1,000 youngsters have been ambulanced from St John's Hospital in Livingston to the Sick Kids Hospital here in Edinburgh because of the closure of the children's unit there. The Health Secretary pledged to reinstate the 24-7 paediatric service at the hospital in October, some three years after the service was cut. That promise was broken. Families across West Lothian feel completely failed by this SNP government. First Minister, parents have asked me to ask you this question. When will the 24-7 service actually return? First Minister. Uh, well, it will return 24-7 uh, when it is clinically safe for it to do so. And I would have thought that was the priority for everyone. The Health Secretary actually met last month with local parents and NHS Lothian will continue to listen uh, to suggestions about how uh, they further improve uh, the service and maximise outpatient activity. Uh, of course, uh, the service is not uh, closed, uh, but children who are sick need to be cared for in the best possible place with the best quality of clinical care. And that's exactly what this government will continue to prioritise. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Liam Kerr. The First Minister will be aware that the 18th of December marks the second anniversary of the tragic fire at Cameron House. Mrs Midgley, who lost her son in the fire, is still waiting for answers two years on. Will the First Minister ensure that the Lord Advocate meets with Mrs Midgley, who has not had a face-to-face -face meeting with the Crown Office in over seven months? And secondly, the investigation has concluded, reports have been received, so can the First Minister please ensure that decisions are made by the Crown Office without any further delay. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I take the opportunity uh, to convey my thoughts again to the families bereaved in the Cameron House fire? It's uh, impossible for any of us to imagine what they are going through, particularly um, at this time of year as we approach the anniversary. Uh, if Jackie Bailey can take this in the spirit it is intended, it is not appropriate for me to instruct the Lord Advocate because the Lord Advocate operates independently of ministers in the investigation of deaths and in any uh, potential criminal prosecutions. I will, of course, convey uh, Jackie Bailey's question and request to the Lord Advocate and ask the Lord Advocate to respond directly to Jackie Bailey. But the independence uh, of the law officers in these matters is a very important part of our constitution and one I'm sure all of us would want to uh, respect. But I do understand uh, the desire, the very legitimate desire of families to have answers to the questions that they have. And I think all of us want to see uh, that happen uh, as soon as possible. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Some months ago, I was contacted by a constituent near Peterhead. He told me that an elderly family member suffering with significant underlying medical conditions that make him particularly vulnerable was unable to get a GP appointment for a flu vaccination for over two months. Now, the SNP's failures have led to NHS Grampian having some of the worst waiting times, GP practices closing, and many patients not getting vital vaccinations. Presiding Officer, the SNP have the powers. Thanks to record NHS funding coming to Scotland from the UK government, they have the funds. They can end the underfunding of NHS Grampian. So will the First Minister show she is serious about improving NHS Grampian by delivering the £165 million the Press and Journal reports today it has missed out on? First Minister. Well, there is record investment in our NHS, notwithstanding uh, the austerity cuts that we've uh, had imposed upon us by the Conservative Westminster Government. Uh, let me just remind the Conservatives who don't like hearing this that next year the Scottish budget will be £1.5 billion lower in real terms than it was at the start of the decade uh, when the Conservatives took office. Notwithstanding that, we are investing uh, record sums in the National Health Service. Spending in the National Health Service in Scotland per person is £136 more than it is in England where the Conservatives are in government. We've also got record numbers of people working in our National Health Service. Uh, so we'll continue to make the investments, uh, deliver the reforms and get on with the job uh, and hopefully uh, come the end of this week uh, we won't have a Conservative government imposing yet more austerity on the Scottish budget. Thank you. Question three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Half a million people marched through Madrid this week at the COP25 conference to demand climate action. Meanwhile, the UK's plans for tackling the climate emergency have been rated insufficient. It's no wonder that Tories have been absent from climate debates in the election. But there's a cosy consensus in this parliament that also ignores the science. The science says we must not use all the fossil fuels we know about let alone explore for more. Opening COP25, the UN Secretary General called for the political will to stop subsidies for fossil fuels as the planet is close to the point of no return. 
So will the First Minister accept the science like the progressive New Zealand government has and recognise that fossil fuels need to stay in the ground? First Minister. Well, can I say, first of all, Rosanna Cunningham, <coughs> the Environment Secretary, is at COP25 in Madrid uh, right now, uh, representing the Scottish Government and, of course, uh, helping with the preparations for COP26, which will take place in Glasgow next year. Uh, the Scottish Government does accept the science. That's why we put forward and had passed in this Parliament uh, the most ambitious climate change targets of any country in the world, not just in terms of the headline targets, uh, but in terms of what's included in our calculation of emissions. Uh, in terms of fossil fuels, I have made very clear we are in a transition away from fossil fuels. That transition must accelerate, but we must make sure that transition happens in a way that satisfies two things. Firstly, that it doesn't uh, lead to an increase in our dependence on imports, which would actually increase, not decrease, our carbon footprint in the short term. And secondly, we must do it in a way that is just and fair so that we don't leave people behind. That's why we've established the Just Transition Commission. Uh, so we will continue to take forward the actions on this front. 75% of our electricity already comes from uh, renewable sources and we now need to replicate that success in terms of how we heat our homes and how we travel uh, to work and in other ways. And I hope that in terms of consensus, the consensus that will be in this parliament is around uh, the actions, sometimes the quite tough actions that we will have to take to meet those world leading targets. Alison Johnson. I think the First Minister is fond of saying that the tap can't be turned off overnight. And no one's suggesting that. But the just transition that the First Minister speaks about has to start now. And frankly, the evidence that that's happening is unavailable. Absolutely. The Scottish Government is not doing enough to reduce demand for fossil fuels. Now, the First Minister could take her huge road expansion fund and put it into expanding public transport. Her government could decide that they want to properly insulate every home to eliminate fuel poverty. Instead, and incredibly, since the Paris Agreement, oil and gas extraction is up in Scotland. Transport emissions are up in Scotland. And the world leading targets are being missed. Instead of kowtowing to that fossil fuel lobby, will the First Minister please get her act together before thousands march at COP26 in Glasgow? First Minister. Well, the transition is underway. I already uh, said 75% of our electricity already comes from renewable sources. The Scottish Government supports renewable energy. Some of that has been frustrated in uh, the perverse decisions that UK governments have taken, particularly around onshore wind and the continued obsession of the Tories and Labour, I'm sorry to say, about nuclear power. Uh, but if I can point to the uh, energy efficiency schemes to help people insulate their homes, the new regulation we've spoken about to make sure uh, that we are putting in place the rules that say from 2024 uh, houses should not have fossil fuel boilers, but uh, boilers using renewable sources, uh, the £500 million investment in bus infrastructure uh, to encourage people out of their cars. We're ahead of the rest of the UK. In fact, I think we're ahead of most of Europe when it comes to the charging infrastructure to support the move to electric and low emission vehicles. So these things are already happening. Of course, we want them to accelerate, but perhaps the Greens might want to get involved in some of the discussions about what is actually happening. I'd certainly uh, welcome that. Thank you. Some further supplementary questions. The first from Keith Brown, to be followed by Monica Lennon. Keith Brown. Boris Johnson has said that EU citizens have been able to treat the UK, in his words, as if it's part of their own country for too long. Does the First Minister agree that these comments are utterly disgraceful and that migrants who have chosen to live in Scotland are welcome? And not only do we want them to stay, we want them to feel like Scotland is their home. First Minister. Boris Johnson's uh, dog whistle uh, anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric is disgraceful um, and in my view it's one of uh, many reasons that he is not fit uh, to hold the office of Prime Minister and I hope on Friday he will not hold the office of Prime Minister. Uh, my view on this is very straightforward and it's one I have expressed consistently and I'm glad to have the opportunity to do so again today. Uh, if somebody comes from another country in Europe or elsewhere and uh, makes a contribution to Scotland, decides to make this country their home, then they have every right to treat this country as their own because it is their own. It is their home. They are welcome here. Uh, we appreciate the contribution and value the contribution they make and we want them to stay. And I want Scotland always to be a country that is open, welcoming and inclusive. Um, and the Tories are a real and present danger to that, which is one of many reasons why we need to get rid of them. 
Monica Lennon to be followed by Andy White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Patients living with chronic pain conditions continue to face excruciating waiting times. Quarterly figures released yesterday confirmed the proportion of people waiting more than four months for their first appointment is actually increasing. Why is progress not being made, First Minister? And will the First Minister apologise for this and to the thousands of people who feel their quality of life has, is suffering because they are stuck on NHS waiting list just to get that first appointment? First Minister. Uh, well, progress is being made in terms of the waiting times improvement plan, which of course covers those waiting for appointments for chronic pain as uh, for other uh, conditions. Uh, in terms of reducing the longest waits in our health service, uh, £108 million has been vested so far in this financial year from the total £850 million uh, waiting times improvement plan, and that's about increase in capacity uh, to reduce waiting times right across the NHS. So we will continue to work with NHS boards on the various actions that they are taking uh, to remodel their services and to build extra capacity because that is the work uh, that we need to do. Andy Whiteman. The First Minister will be aware of job cuts at NewsQuest and the journalists, that journalists there have voted for strike action. She'll be aware that this is just the latest challenge for Scottish print media following a 44% decline in circulation since 2006. Does she agree with me that a free press is a vital part of any democracy? Does she agree that journalists losing their jobs undermines the vital role the media have, uh, the media play in holding power to account? And does she agree that a political, at a political level, we need to explore what can be done to restore and sustain a healthy, vibrant print media? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree that uh, a free uh, media is absolutely essential to the health of our democracy. I think it is always a matter of uh, concern and regret when uh, journalists lose their jobs and are made redundant. All of us uh, feel the discomfort of uh, media scrutiny from time to time, but it is absolutely essential that we have journalists there uh, to do that, to hold us to account and to make sure uh, that that scrutiny on behalf of the, the public happens. Um, I do think, in looking at NewsQuest in particular, some of the cuts that are happening there um, are, are deeply concerning. I won't comment uh, too much on uh, the vote for strike action. That's for uh, the workers there uh, to decide, but I, I fully understand the sentiment. Um, obviously, politicians uh, have to always be careful about uh, how we uh, look to intervene or anything that could be construed as interfering in the media, but I think all of us want to make sure we're doing what we can to support uh, not just a free and fair media, but a vibrant and successful uh, media as well in Scotland and indeed in countries across the world. Thank you. Question number four. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I should preface my question by declaring an interest as the convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will ban the use of snares. First Minister. Well, we have already led the way in the UK on regulating the use of snares. We have by far the strongest laws on snaring in the UK. Uh, they include requiring <laughs> snare operators to be trained and registered with the police. Uh, and also requiring snares to carry a tag which identifies the operator. There are also requirements in keeping snaring records, types of snares and where they can be placed. Use of illegal snares is a wildlife crime and offenders will be pursued by the police. Christine Graham. I uh, thank the First Minister for her answer. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware that the SSPCA, one kind in the League Against Cruel Sports, has graphic evidence, notwithstanding the regulations, graphic evidence of deer, badgers and even domestic cats caught in snares and all have called for an outright ban, which I have supported all along. This is indiscriminate and cruel. And notwithstanding the Scottish Natural Heritage reviewed the use of snares in 2016, if the First Minister cannot agree on an outright ban, will the First Minister support calls for an independent review of all traps used in Scotland, that review to be done by academics specialising in animal welfare, disinterested parties? First Minister. Well, can I thank Christine Graham for raising this issue? I am aware of the kind of images that she uh, referred to, and uh, such images are shocking and understandably very distressing. And I would say to anyone who is concerned about the inappropriate use of snares that they should report that to the police. Uh, we do keep snaring under review. Um, it's reviewed every five years under the Wildlife and Countryside uh, Act. And 
can I say very clearly that we will not hesitate to take further action if there is evidence that the current uh, regulation is being abused. I also think this may well be an issue uh, that the new Animal Welfare Commission, which is currently being set up, will want to consider. Uh, we also want, of course, to encourage alternative approaches, uh, such as that used by Forestry Land Scotland and highlighted this week on Country File. Uh, their wildlife management approach focuses on creating suitable habit habitats in which predator and prey can coexist. So I understand uh, and recognise these concerns and the government will continue uh, to keep it under review and to make sure that appropriate action and further regulation if necessary is taken. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour has long supported the ban on snares and that that should be made a legal ban. This practice is completely unacceptable and is a random form of animal management and is deplorable animal cruelty in many cases. It's quite simple. It's not when the system is being abused. My question is, when is snaring going to be banned? And will the Scottish Government move into the 21st century on this, implement a full ban on this barbaric practice? And if not, why not? First Minister. Uh, well, as I've said, we do keep uh, this under review and, and will continue to do so. I've already said, and I, I think it is a recognition of some of the points that have been made, uh, both by Christine Graham and by Claudia Beamish, we have the toughest regulation already of any country in the UK, um, but we need to make sure that that is fit for purpose and we'll continue uh, to review that and consult as necessary if we think further changes to legislation are required. And Mark Russell? As we've already heard, snaring causes extreme suffering. We must have a ban delivered now, but we also need more experts in the field detecting and reporting on illegal snaring and other wildlife crimes. So does the First Minister agree that it's time to empower the Scottish SPCA to investigate wildlife crime, give them the additional powers that they already have under the Animal Welfare Act in relation to domestic animals, give them the powers to tackle wildlife crime? First Minister. I'm certainly very happy to consider the issue of more powers for the SPCA. Of course, we have uh, introduced the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill, which will increase the maximum available penalties for uh, domestic animal, animal and wildlife offences. Uh, so these are issues that will be coming before the Parliament in any event, and I'm happy to give consideration to the point Mark Ruskell makes. Thank you. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what assistance the Scottish Government is providing to public services and the third sector to address the issue of loneliness amongst older people over the festive period. First Minister. Uh, we know that loneliness can be felt at any time and at any stage of life, but over the Christmas period it can be particularly hard for older people. Uh, the needs of older people, of course, is one of the priorities of our national strategy on social inclusion, uh, social isolation, uh, sorry, and loneliness, which is supported with up to a million pounds in funding. Uh, we've provided £140,000 this year to Age Scotland's helpline, which is a, a vital link for some older people. And we've also committed £80,000 to the befriending network. Uh, I think, though, we can all play a part. Uh, Christmas, perhaps, is a time uh, for remembering that a simple act of kindness for an older person who may be lonely only could go a long way and perhaps that's something all of us should reflect on over these next couple of weeks. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the uh, First Minister for that uh, response and uh, associate myself with some of those words. The First Minister be aware of the research which found that over 100,000 people uh, will be sitting down to Christmas dinner alone this year. That number has risen by 40,000 in just two years. Uh, one in four pensioners who live alone identify themselves as Lonely, and the impact of this is quite well documented and is attributed to declining mental and physical health amongst our elderly population. I think given that there's still a huge amount of stigma surrounding this subject, so can I ask the First Minister if she shares the view of Age Scotland that tackling loneliness as a public health crisis should be a priority and will she join me in sharing that message that we all have a role to play in reaching out to those inner communities over the festive period that sometimes small gestures make all the difference to someone living on their own. First Minister. Um, yes, I, I do agree with that. I, I very much agree that we should see this as a public health issue. And as I said in my uh, initial answer, I, I do think we should all reflect on the role we can play and uh, small acts of kindness and caring for others, particularly older people in our own families and in our own communities. I think there is a lot of good work being done to raise awareness of uh, this issue. Uh, for example, the Scotsman campaign encouraging readers to reach out and also raising awareness of a new app that's been piloted 
to help loneliness in the Western Isles and Argyll and Butte. Um, we ov ov also obviously are, are the first country so far in the UK to have the national strategy on social isolation and loneliness. And I think it's got uh, a lot of good uh, suggestions in it about how we take this forward collectively. So I think uh, whether it's government, uh, Parliament as a whole, uh, working with the third sector and communities across the country, it is definitely an issue we have to do more on. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for us to uh, send that message over the Christmas period. Thank you. Question six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to research suggesting that children in poorer areas have almost 10% fewer choices of subjects in secondary schools than those in better off areas. First Minister. Well, pupils should be able to choose their preferred subjects. When a subject can't be offered in uh, one school, there is flexibility to consider alternative approaches such as travel to a nearby school, college or university. And we know from the recent headteacher survey that this is happening with 97% of headteachers saying that they are flexible in their approach and offer individualised timetables uh, wherever that is possible. We're also already seeing progress of the attainment gap uh, closing at Scottish credit and qualifications framework levels 3, 4, 5 and 6. The gap in attainment between the most deprived pupils and the least deprived pupils has reduced considerably uh, between 2009-10 and 2017-18. Daniel Johnson. The comprehensive principle means that pupils should have the same opportunities regardless of the school they go to or where they live. But this research calls into question whether that is still a reality for young people in our poorest communities. At S5, the data shows that the average number of entries in the most deprived schools is 3.4 compared to 4.3 in the most affluent. A 20% gap in choices between the richest and poorest taking their highest. In practical terms, this means the brightest kids from the poorest neighbourhoods will find it harder to get in, onto the best university courses because the option of taking particular combinations of subjects to higher and advanced higher is simply not open to them. Now, the government will regularly trot out the line there are more options and more qualifications available, but what does that matter if young people do not have the opportunity to take them or there are different options at different schools in different areas? So does the First Minister accept the author's conclusion that in Scotland, the poorer you are, the fewer choices you get, or is the comprehensive principle simply no longer important to this government? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't accept that, and I don't think the evidence uh, backs that up. Uh, as I said in my original answer, uh, young people should be able to take their preferred subjects. Uh, there will be occasions where that can't uh, always happen in their own school. Uh, that was the case when I was at school. On occasion, uh, travel to a neighbouring school was uh, required. But uh, it's not just about trotting out a line. There are more qualifications and there are more options available for young people today than has ever been the case. Um, and as I said in uh, my original answer, if you look at all of the credit and qualification levels, three, four, five and six, uh, we see young people leaving school with more qualifications and credits. And we also see that gap between uh, the richest and the poorest closing. There's more work to be done there, uh, but progress is being made and we'll continue to focus on accelerating it in the years to come. Ross Greer. Thank you. If the First Minister disagrees with the available evidence on subject choice inequality, will she instruct her education agency to actually assess the scale of this problem? Because when the Education Committee have repeatedly asked them to do so, they've believed for some reason it's not their responsibility. First Minister. Well, as I'm sure Ross Greer is aware, that is part of the purpose of the senior phase review, uh, which the Deputy First Minister has already instructed uh, and which will progress uh, over the coming months. Uh, it is important that young people have uh, the choices uh, that they want to have in terms of subject choice. But uh, as I say, uh, the evidence in terms of uh, numbers of qualifications um, that, and the gap in attainment in terms of qualifications suggests that uh, over the whole of the senior phase, uh, young people are are, uh, attaining and achieving more and the focus uh, of this government is making sure that we continue to see that progress. Question number seven, Angus Macdonald. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is working with international partners to tackle climate change. First Minister. Well, tackling the climate emergency is uh, a priority for all of us and it's something that we all have a moral responsibility to do, but it is not something that any one country can do on its own. Uh, that's why our partnerships with other countries and through organisations like the Under Two Coalition are so important. Uh, the Scottish Government has played an active part in the UN International Climate Conferences over the past decade. As I said uh, a few moments ago, Rosanna Cunningham is currently in Madrid uh, preparing the ground for COP26 in Glasgow. Um, I 
want, I'm sure we all want COP26 to be inclusive, where all voices are heard in a respectful and collaborative way, and that includes the voices of the Global South. Uh, we recognise that climate change disproportionately impacts poorer nations, which is why we established the Climate Justice Fund, uh, the first of uh, any government in the world to do so. Angus Macdonald. I thank the First Minister for a reply. Um, we know that the only way we can successfully tackle the, glo uh, the global climate emergency is for all nations to work together. That said, uh, in order for Scotland to meet the ambitious target to reach net zero by 2045, we need action from across the UK. So can the First Minister outline where the UK Government has failed to step up thus far? First Minister. Well, we do need the UK Government to take uh, action. Uh, in fact, the Committee on Climate Change was very clear about the areas where it needs to take action. If Scotland is to be able to meet our targets, uh, carbon capture and storage, for example, accelerating their transition to electric and low emission uh, vehicles uh, were two of the areas uh, that they highlighted. I would also want to see them uh, give more support to onshore wind and drop the obsession with nuclear power. So these are just some examples of uh, the actions we need to see them take. I, I hope we have a UK government after this election that does give greater priority to tackling the climate emergency, not just to the setting of the targets, but also to the actions that have to be taken uh, to meet those targets. Um, I think it was deeply regrettable that Boris Johnson didn't come to the debate, uh, the leaders' debate on uh, these issues. And I think that sends a, a rather poor s signal of the level of priority that is given. But there is no doubt at all that the Scottish Government will lead by example. We will seek to work with the UK Government and we will seek to work with governments across the world uh, to tackle this driving moral imperative of getting our emissions to net zero um, and tackling what is a climate emergency. Thank you very much. And that concludes the First Minister's questions. We've got a few items of business just before we conclude the session uh, or the day. Uh, the next item is consideration of business motion 20199 uh, in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau uh, setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak on this motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 20199 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 20200 in the name of Graham Day setting out a stage two timetable for a bill. Could I call on the Graham Day to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. <clears throat> Thank you. And again, no one has asked to speak of the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 20200 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions, um, 20201 and 20202, on approval of an SSI. Could I call on Graham Day to move these motions? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now minded to accept a motion uh, without notice to bring forward decision time till now. Would the Minister move such a motion? Presiding officer moved. Thank you very much. So the question is that we move decision time till now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So there are just two questions today. Well, I propose asking a single question on the two motions. Does anyone object? No. The question is that motions 20201 and 20202 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.